Hello, everyone. My name is Stephen. I'm a PhD student in the Department of Computer Science at Virginia Commonwealth University. Today, we're looking at our work on adversarial occupancy monitoring using one-sided through-wall Wi-Fi sensing. So let's start our discussion with Wi-Fi sensing. Wi-Fi sensing uses Wi-Fi signals to perform physical sensing tasks. Uh, so the idea is the signals that we receive uh, are affected by physical attributes of the environment, such as furniture placement, size of the room. And most importantly for our work, the signals are affected in some way by the physical movements and actions of different humans in the environment. This area of research has become particularly popular because it can leverage existing Wi-Fi infrastructure. And that's really powerful because we have Wi-Fi already deployed in our homes and in our offices and elsewhere. Let's compare Wi-Fi sensing to other systems. Compared to wearables, uh, Wi-Fi sensing is device free. You do not need to put a device on the person to be able to sense what they're doing. Compared to videos, Wi-Fi sensing works without, light, without any light sources. It also does not require a line of sight view into the target area because Wi-Fi signals bounce off of everything omnidirectionally. This brings up what we're mainly looking at today, and that is adversarial issues with Wi-Fi sensing. Because these devices can be hidden out of view um, and they can even be placed outside of the target area, and also because Wi-Fi is so ubiquitously placed throughout all of our lives, this brings up a lot of issues that an adversary could use this for bad intentions. So the goal of our work here is the following. There are two specific goals we want to look at. The first is through wall occupancy monitoring. So on the left, you can see we have a hallway environment. We've got two walls right here and right here. The human walks across this hallway back and forth, however many times. The transmitter and the receiver, TX and RX, are transmitting through the wall into the hallway environment where the target is moving. So that's the first use case that we want to look at. The second one is more of an adversarial method. What would an adversary be able to do? That's right here. They place their transmitter and receiver both on the same side, on the same side of the wall in one room. This is considered non line of sight or NLOS because the target is no longer moving in between the transmitter and the receiver. When we talk about Wi Fi, we need to think about what metrics of the signal can we actually use. So the most common is the received signal strength indicator, RSSI. So RSSI for each received. Wi-Fi frame, we get a single scalar RSSI value. On the other hand, more popular lately metric is channel state information, CSI. For each received Wi-Fi frame, we receive a complex vector of size 64. Now, how do we decide which one's best? Quite simply, RSSI is a simple metric, but it's prone to noise. While CSI is large, uh, but the issue is data, uh, more data can increase the complexity of our given model. So simple is better if we can do it. So what we're going to do first is look at, can we use RSSI for our two use cases? So right here uh, at the top of the slide, we're considering the line of sight experiment. We can see if we look at the RSSI response as time goes on, two distinct peaks appear. They're marked with a dotted line to indicate that the time when the target was walking past the line of sight was right at those peaks. So the outcome of this is we can use RSSI, we can look for peaks, we can use RSSI to easily detect line of sight movement. On the other hand, if we go down and look at non-line of sight, we can see there are these two dotted lines that indicate a target walked by, but we do not see such a peak in our RSSI. The outcome is RSSI is bad for non-line of sight. So let's look at CSI. Maybe that can help us instead. So here's a bit of background, a bit more background on CSI. CSI is a metric used in orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, 
or OFDM. OFDM is used in Wi-Fi systems to encode data on multiple frequencies so we can transmit multiple symbols in parallel. CSI is estimated uh, using the following equation right here. So the main thing we want to look at is H, which is our CSI. So it's a, again, it's a complex vector which contains an element per subcarrier with a real and an imaginary component. If we take those real and imaginary components, what we can do is we can derive amplitude and phase. So for our system, we have 64 subcarriers, and out of those, 52 of them contain actual CSI, and the rest of them are null. There's zeroed out. So as we collect CSI, we're collecting much more data than compared to RSSI. So our first step is to do some intelligent pre-processing of our CSI. Step one is to take that raw CSI vector that we collected and create CSI amplitude for each of those subcarriers. The second step is to create a windowed outlier filter. So CSI can also be noisy due to some factors like hardware and software. So what we want to do is we want to filter out any obvious invalid samples. So for each new sample, we compare it to some number of previously recorded amplitude samples. If the new sample is too dissimilar to the preceding samples, then it's most likely an anomaly. It's an outlier. So in which case we can filter it out. This brings us to step number three. Uh, step number three is another windowed function. This time we're looking at how much noise is present in each independent subcarrier. Uh, so what we do is we look at a window, uh, some window size, and we look at how much noise is found in that window from some time in the past up until the current sample at time t. By the end of step three, we still have 64 subcarriers worth of data, or 52. Um, in fact, we haven't done any calculations that cross over multiple subcarriers. They're all, all the subcarriers are independent. So for step four, we're looking at intra-subcarrier agreement. The idea is if one subcarrier finds a high amount of noise, but none of the other subcarriers agree that they see high noise, then probably it's, some anomaly. It's another anomaly. On the other hand, if multiple subcarriers show a high amount of noise, then there's likely something in the environment that's causing this high noise across all of these subcarriers. What we're thinking it is, is a human target. So we use this ACSI um, value to identify human movements in the following scenarios. So here, what we've got is using ACSI, we first look at uh, our line of sight case. Here, we can see that there are four distinct peaks in our ACSI. On the x-axis is time and y-axis is ACSI. So these four distinct peaks do match up with when our target walks across the line of sight. So again, ACSI is easy for line of sight. Now we want to look at non-line of sight. Here, we can see non-line of sight shows a very noisy scenario. This is because the placement of the transmitter and receiver have one important bad attribute. Because they're placed so close to each other on the same wall, the most distinct signal received by the receiver is the shortest path between Tx to Rx. That's in the same room that they're located. So while the signal is bouncing into the hallway and back to the receiver, that signal is much less powerful than the signal directly from the transmitter to the receiver. So to fix this, what we do is we apply some shielding. And what that is, is just two small metal tins surrounding the devices to make sure that the line of sight is diverted so that the signal goes into the hallways. After applying the shielding, we can see again, we, these peaks are appearing as we were hoping for. If we go back to using RSSI, we can see that even with shielding, RSSI does not show distinct peaks. So we cannot use RSSI in this case. ACSI is still an important metric. Now that we see these distinct peaks, we want to formalize a method for recognizing human presence. We'll start with some definitions. C is the class for a given sample that we record. So each sample can either be marked as having a target present or no target present. Next, we have NC, and that's just the number 
of samples that we've collected in total of that given class. Our first metric that we use to evaluate our system is PC samples right here. The goal is to identify the percentage of samples which are marked as a given class for a given threshold value tau. We can see uh, in this plot over here, as we increase tau, the percentage of true positive starts at 100% and slowly goes down to 0%. Inversely, when we start with a low value of tau, we have a 0% true negatives and quickly we end up with 100% true negatives. What is important to notice is that there's no overlap where we can achieve 100% true positives and 100% true negatives. So instead, this leads us to our next step. We want to detect human presence per segment rather than for each and every sample. For this, we need to consider our recording from a time domain. When a target first becomes present, they'll remain present for some number of samples before finally disappearing. For all of those samples where the target is present, that's one segment of data where we know all of those samples should be marked as a target. Similarly, until a target reappears, all of the samples in the next segment should contain samples of the class no target. As such, we can simplify our previous method with PC samples into PC segments, as shown uh, in this equation. This time, for all segments labeled as having a target, our model should predict at least one of these samples as having a target. Using this method, we can see in the figure to the far right that we can now see that there are values of tau, right here, where both true negatives and true positives are 100. Here's a comparison of the two methods side by side for PC samples on the left and PC segments on the right. What we can see here is that when we split by segments, we can actually increase the value of tau to better prevent any false positives from showing up. This helps us create a better and more robust system. Finally, we look at leveraging this work to understand human direction. We could visually see previously that a, that a target was present or not present. However, with a single transmitting antenna and a single receiving antenna, we are unable to understand the direction. Instead, if we leverage two receivers, one and two, and a single transmitter in the middle, what we can do is we can gather two streams of ACSI at the same time. So if we look at this top right figure, we can see the first peak shows up for red, Rx2, which is closely followed by a peak in Rx1. And what that indicates to us is that the target started on the right and moved from right to left because it, was, it affected Rx2 first and then Rx1. Similarly, if we continue to look, we can see the peak starts with blue, then red, red, then blue, blue, then red. And that indicates the target moved back and forth, back and forth. Of course, this is our ACSI metric right here. And then down here is our binary prediction that we had made in the previous step. This shows which receiver was affected first and which one, was, which one was affected second. As a conclusion, in this work, we demonstrated how through wall occupancy monitoring can be performed in Wi-Fi sensing in a line of sight scenario, number one. And then we also showed how we can use ACSI to perform adversarial one-sided non-line of sight sensing as well. Finally, we showed how we can use these binary predictions to further understand human direction. Thank you for taking the time to listen. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me. I also left a link to our ESP32 CSI tool if anybody's interested. Thanks.